Happy Friday, Baylor College Medicine and friends of Baylor. First, I need to apologize. First, to all the epidemiologists in the world, I'm going to be talking a little epidemiology. Also, to the vaccinologists, I'm going to say things that they probably won't like or curious. And finally, my sister, because it's going to be a little bit sciencey today, so we'll get through it. Anyway, a few things. On the international side, the CDC just announced that they're going to implement requirements for testing for those people who are coming to this country from China or from, uh, from Hong Kong. This should work just about as well as when the Trump administration prevented people from China coming in. And remember that? Actually, all the viruses came in through other parts of the world. China citizens will be all over. It's not going to work. But, you know, who knows? Uh, politics dominate over science sometimes. Uh, the second thing is uh, Hong Kong is opening its borders uh, to China, so there should be a lot of admixture of new viruses. So it's going to be quite a, a, a thing because right now the Chinese are clearly underreporting what is likely a massive outbreak of COVID uh, in China. In the United States, uh, hospitalizations and test positivity and deaths are rising. Uh, cases are lagging behind, but that's probably because case reporting hasn't been good. But if you look at hospitalizations, almost 47,000 people are currently hospitalized. So it's not quite as bad as it, at its peak, but it is coming up as we predicted. And in Connecticut, where they have eight uh, counties now listed as having high uh, coronavirus infection transmission rates, they've already started uh, reinstating mask orders. Uh, so, you know, I think this is going to be seen in many, many communities, but, but we'll have to wait and see. As you'll recall, this is where we are for case numbers. This is a heat map for case numbers. I put up November 18th because you can see almost nothing in the southeast. We had this nice lull, but because our wastewater numbers were going up, you can see now it's increasing uh, numbers in all the southeast and, and along the uh, Atlantic coast all the way up to uh, New York. And these are all underestimates. If you look at hospitalization, these are admissions across the country, you can see there's been about a two-fold increase in the number of hospitalizations. And if you look at the case number, the case number has been flat, but I put in here, what would it be if it was two times more? It would look like a lot like the surge we had in July, which is, by the way, interesting. Every six months, we seem to have a surge. So we had the giant surge of Omicron in January, then it went away, then we had a surge in July, and then six months later, another surge. We don't have good data yet for when you're gonna need another vaccination, but it kind of looks like the peaks are coming every six months, and my guess is between six and 12 months, you'll probably need a booster. What's going on in Texas? Texas is going up. Harris County is now up to moderate. Our friends at Dimmick County are still kind of low to moderate. But in the Texas Medical Center, where I think we have the best data, we're up to 11.8% of all hospitalizations testing positive for COVID, which is actually quite high. If you look at the hospitalization numbers, the number the hospitalizations have gone up almost threefold. So this was the peak in the summer, and this is where it's going now. It's almost the same peak. So my guess is, if you look at that, case rates are also going up, but they're underreported. Our own Dr. Syed Reza, who's uh, at our hospital, has said that about 40% of the patients who are positive in the hospital are actually there for symptomatic reasons, but that means 60% are showing up hospitalized for other reasons, but positive when detected by COVID testing. Uh, not surprisingly, wastewater numbers continue to go up, and that's kind of typical of the national trend. If you look nationally, these red dots, it's going up all over the Midwest, all up along the coast, all the places where you know it's rising, and in the Southeast as well. So that's all predictable. So what is the dominant strain that's driving this? Uh, you're hearing a lot about XBB 1.5 on the news. That's because a lot of the news <laughs> comes out of New York and the East Coast. But actually the dominant strain is not now XBB uh, 1.5, it's the BQ. Now the XBB was one from Singapore, and the BQ variants are the ones from the United Kingdom. And you can see it's still a mixture. It's not a dominant strain yet, although there seems to be a suggestion that XBB is the one from Singapore, is moving towards being the dominant strain. Because if you look in the Northeast, these little Harvey balls, 70% of the strains right now are XBB. In the rest of the country, it's not the case. In the rest of the country, the BQ strains 
are, are dominant, but it looks like XBB 1.5 will begin to move across the country and be the dominant strain. So I was asked uh, one of the most frustrating questions by one of my, my colleagues and often by my sister. I have been vaccinated. I have been boosted. I have, I've gotten my, val my valent boosted. I even got COVID once, and yet I get COVID again. How can that be? So I've been going to try to answer that question, and it's an, it's an important question, but it's, it's complicated. If you look at, you know, these are the sort of reasons why. The first thing is that we keep having these recurring COVID waves. The second issue is that uh, the COVID uh, spike protein keeps mutating. The third issue is that we have waning immunity from either infection or the vaccine. The fourth issue, which I want to show you some data on, is the study design for the vaccines was never intended to be sterilizing. It was never intended to prevent infection. It was intended to prevent symptoms. The fifth reason is that a lot of the strategies have really focused just on the spike protein, and that's a problem with the current vaccines. The sixth biggest reason why we're having these recurrent problems and people keep getting infected is uh, we have a global vaccination problem. We haven't vaccinated the, the entire world, so there's pl plenty of hot spots where viral replication happens. And the seventh is behaviors of people make this pandemic behave a little differently. And there's an interesting paper I'm going to share with you. Well, let's, let's go through each of those very quickly. Here are the recurring waves of COVID. It's really kind of very striking. Omicron was huge, you know, in January, but we had another uh, spike in July. Cases are underrepresented. That's why you don't see the gray line. But the blue line is, is mortality. And it, it clearly shows that while Omicron cases are higher, the mortality rate was less, but there were so many cases, there was still a lot of deaths. So Omicron did cause a lot of problems, and it will cause a lot of problems. It's just not quite as bad as the other variants. Now, the second thing is the spike protein mutates a lot. So this is a great example. This is a, a gene genealogy tree. The early strains, the Delta, Alpha, all those strains were sort of clustered here, and then there was a big change with Omicron. These uh, strains, these early strains, had one or two, three mutations. That was it. And each one dominated by being more infectious. Omicron, which came from South Africa, remember, had over 20 mutations, almost certainly uh, came from an immune-compromised host, so it just sat in that person, replicating, 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 accumulating mutations until it finally became more infectious. That's why Omicron is different. And one of the things to really show this, this is a radial plot of the diversity, and you can see all of the, like Delta and Alpha, the Alpha strains, one mutation, two mutations, very little. That, the distance here represents divergence. Omicron goes over here, and these are all the different strains of Omicron. So Omicron is really uh, replicating, making a lot of mutations, and that's why we have this accumulation of mutations. Well, I'm trying, I'll try to explain to you why uh, each, uh, early on, each uh, strain had just one or two mutations and took over versus what's going on now. And the reason is, early on, our population was naive. We did not have any immune response. And so the selective process, the selective pressure on the virus was just more infectivity. So if you'll recall that, remember that R number, the number of people a, a person can infect in a totally naive population, the R number was between two and three. A person walks in and infects three people. Well, the selective pressure early on was just be more infectious. And so very quickly, the new mutations went to R of three, R to five, R to 10, very infectious viruses. And you can see if it's once competing that only infects three versus one that can infects 10 people, it's like a funnel. Who gets through that funnel the fastest? The, the people who are most infected. And so there's easy competition with just e in more infectious viruses. But you know the population is different now. 90% of the population in the United, United States represented up here has either been infected or vaccinated. So there is general immune, uh, some immune protection against these viruses. So now what happened was since there's no more selective pressure just for infectivity, there's more and more just random mutations happening and not one has a, a greater selective advantage over another until one's able to avoid that immune surveillance that is present in most of the population. And that's what's happened with these recent ones. And it looks like in this case, you get a mutation that avoids uh, immune protection and now it proliferates.
That's why we've seen kind of a pause, all these different viral strains accumulating, but none with a selective advantage until recently, and the mutations in the recent strains show avoidance of immune response. So that, that's, that's the difference between why we had that plateau where we just ended single mutations getting more, vir uh, more infectious, and now we have ones that are mutating to avoid immune surveillance. The third point, I, uh, the point of why we have problems and keep getting infected is there's waning uh, immunity over time. Three good examples, there's clinical evidence. Uh, one study showed that number of people coming in and admitted to the hospital wanes over time, uh, even if they've been vaccinated. A second study looked at actual immune IgG responses waning. Uh, so there's both an immune and clinical waning of the response to the vaccine and infection. So it doesn't last forever, and it does barely last for six to eight months. And if you think about the common cold, which is uh, many of them are coronaviruses, you can, you know, you'll, you might get infected one year and get infected the next year. So we don't have a long-lasting immunity yet. The third or, or the fourth big reason was the vaccine development. It was never intended to prevent infection. If you look at the clinical endpoints for evaluating COVID, it was not intended to be a test negative de uh, design. It was a syndrome negative. In other words, they compared one set of people who are vaccinated to other people for symptoms. So these, these vaccines were developed to reduce symptoms and mortality, not to prevent infection. And so we keep, we see this, I mean, we see getting infected. The, the design of the vaccines will have to be different to prevent, to prevent infection. And for one, for one other issue, we talked about the focus on the, on the, on the uh, spike protein. Makes all the sense in the world, the spike protein binds the ACE2 receptor. That's obviously the right thing to focus on, but the spike protein is constantly varying. So that's the least stable of the proteins. In contrast, for example, the nucleocapsid protein doesn't change much. So future vaccines need to focus on either the narrower receptor binding domain, which is a finite number of combinations, or some other uh, proteins that are more stable, or a combination of the two. The other thing I mentioned, the sixth thing, was policy. Look at the distribution of vaccines in the world. Africa, almost unvaccinated. China is almost unvaccinated. So lots of places in the world for vaccination. And then the final thing, which is a really interesting paper, is the behavior of our population. So when most people model out, when epidemiologists model out um, uh, response to infection, it's usually in what's called an SIR model, which is there's a susceptible population. In red, there's an infected population. And then there's a green here that recovered from infection with immunity. And so you usually get a spike that disappears. That assumes that everybody behaves as a homogeneous population. These non-biological scientists, physicists, uh, engineers got together and came up with this model called the Stochastic Social Behavior Model. And what they pointed out is we don't behave like a homogeneous group. We actually have people who are socially isolated, that's indicated here, living in the house, that occasionally go into like party time where they add mix with other people who may be infected in red or resistant in blue. But they don't all, they, we don't all add mix at once. And, and what, what that does is it means uh, there will be people who, even though the whole, you would think the whole population is infected, there will be people who are not interacting socially who remain uh, susceptible to the virus. So what does that do? Well, that means, is if, if, and they use the, their model to, to look at, at deaths from uh, the last uh, couple of years, and their model predicted the blue line the typical SIR model predicted the red line. So they were actually right. So the example I can think of that describes this most is if you look at like a, a bacterial culture with media, you put a bacteria in a bottle of media, there's phases. There's the lag phase, there's the logarithmic phase of growth, the stationary phase, and a death phase. That's sort of the way humans are the media, the virus is like the bacteria, and that's kind of the way the models work except for one thing, there's something called continuous culture where in that bottle you throw in new media, new, something to support growth. And so instead of seeing the death phase, what you see is the decline, then you put more media in, goes up, then it declines again, put more media up, declines again. That's sort of what these guys are predicting. They're predicting that there are people who are not interacting socially, 
who constantly enter the, the pool of patients in the, in the world and provide new sources for the virus to infect. So that's a very interesting phenomenon. It hasn't been traditionally thought about in most uh, epidemics, but I think it explains some of the reasons why we're having waves dropping off and then having new waves and also having plateaus. So if you look at what should be done, you know, based on all this stuff, for one thing, we need to change our vaccine strategy. Right now, we're chasing mutations. And in fact, we were doing it one mutation at a time, which is terrible. We now have a bivalent vaccine, but that's probably not enough. So one thing is focus on the receptor binding domain, a very narrow uh, focus. Work by Bart Haynes has been doing just that. If you find uh, the very important binding uh, nucleotides, the very specific ones, you get broad neutralization. That should be a really intense area of study. Uh, the other thing is the, the rest of the spike protein is flopping around, but when it binds the receptor, it assumes a conformation, and there are only three or four or five structural conformations that can, it can form, and so we should be using structural biology to predict those and then create intelligently designed vaccines to those structures because the antibodies recommend those or recognize those structures. We need more durable vaccines. A vaccine that lasts six months is not good. We need to be studying both B and T cells in terms of their longevity of, of being able to protect us. Uh, we need way more multivalent uh, vaccines. A bivalent may be, not be enough. We may need a trivalent or a quadrivalent based on some antibodies that recognize the, the uh, Spike protein, maybe other antibodies that recognize, or antigens that to generate antibodies that recognize other parts of the virus. So that's very important. We need to develop cheaper, more easily distributable vaccines, like what Peter Hotez has developed. And we need to start thinking about vaccines that can prevent infection, ones that generate higher IgA response, let's say. And we need to continue to develop antivirals and create a broad viral network, viral tra uh, tri vaccine trials network so we can do these studies and, and make very rapid progresses in vaccine development. So that's my explanation for why we see, even though all these things happen, we get vaccinated and all this stuff, and yet we're seeing waves and more or recurring infection. I, I hope that helps some people understand this. I want to finish today with a couple of shout outs. First of all, uh, to Peter Hotez and Dr. Maria Elena Botazzi, we're named at the Dallas Morning News of the, as Texans of the Year. So congratulations to them. Also to Dr. Mandeep Bajaj, professor of medicine who's, uh, in, who's just got named as the um, president-elect of medicine and science of the American Diabetes Association. And I want to end today with a special shout out to Lily. Uh, Lily's uh, niece, Lucy, just, to, just two years old, passed away from an aggressive and unusual B-cell lymphoma. And Lily is on medical leave uh, helping support the family. We'll see her back next week. And until then, I can't wait to see you next week.